Hey, this is Scott, and today we're taking a look at yet another camera monitor, this time a pretty unique one, the LH5T from Portkeys. Welcome to the channel, or welcome back if you've been here before. This channel's all about reviews with no fluff, just as much pure information as I can get into video form, so if you like what you see, be sure to subscribe and check out more content in the future. This may be a bit of a longer video because I want to go really in depth here, so if you want to skip ahead to a certain portion of the video, check the video description, I will have a timeline down there where you can do just that. The LH5T is a 5 inch camera monitor with HDMI in and out that can natively accept up to 4K 30 frames per second signals, meaning your camera doesn't have to downscale for you if you don't want it to. And it's also a touchscreen, which gives it a few extra tricks up its sleeve, which we'll talk about later. It's 450 nits in terms of brightness, which isn't spectacularly bright, but the screen has a 1080 resolution with a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio. Not a bad image overall, but not the most amazing either. It's powered by Sony MPF style batteries, takes DC power in, and it can also send power out to your camera if you have a compatible cable and dummy battery. There's a USB port for firmware upgrading and loading 3D LUTs, as well as a 3.5mm headphone jack if you want to monitor your audio on a camera that doesn't already have a jack built in. The design is simple. It's very lightweight and mostly plastic, but with a pretty good feel to it. On the back, the Sony MPF style battery plate can easily be removed, and I love that because if you're powering it on through the DC in port, it's just unnecessary to have this extra bulk on here. With other monitors, even if this is removable, you usually have to screw it off and unplug it or something. This is a small detail, but it's great. You have a single quarter 20 screw thread on the bottom, along with the USB and DC power inputs, and I wish they had just put one more screw thread on the side because you do have that dead space over there. Up top is where the magic happens, so let's take a look at that. There are four customizable function buttons, a power slider, an exit button, and a pushable dial. I actually really like this design overall, but it's not something you'll definitely know how to use right out of the box, so let's get into it. Speaking of out of the box, let's just quickly go over what was actually in the box. You get a very thick and heavy duty sunshade which actually attaches inside of the frame that's on the monitor itself and another optional bottom part for the sunshade which is cool and not usually included with other monitors. You get some screen protectors that I haven't put on yet, I probably should, and you get a USB. Yes, they actually include a USB which is good for two reasons. One is because there are no paper instructions in here. It's very eco-friendly of them. The instructions are actually on the USB, so go ahead and check that out to make the most of this monitor, or you know, you could just watch the rest of this video. Two is because you can actually load LUTs into this monitor, which is great, and now you don't even need your own USB to do it. Powering on the monitor, you'll see that it's not the fastest startup time, but it's also not the slowest. The four function buttons up top will toggle the functions that you set in the menu on and off, and holding them down for a few seconds will, in most cases, bring up a sort of sub-menu with a handful of function-specific details that you can tweak. This is important to know because if you don't know that, it might seem like there's a lot less to the monitor than there actually is. The dial is also a button, and pushing it down will open the menu and select things, while scrolling will obviously scroll. Scrolling while not in the menu will adjust the headphone volume. The last button here will exit out of the menus, and with the touchscreen turned on, you can do some of these things with the touchscreen as well, and we'll check that out little by little as we go through the menu, which we'll do right now. Like I said, you can open the menu by pushing the scroll wheel, or you could tap on the screen and then touch these settings on the side and it will open up the menu for you. You can also select stuff in the menu by tapping on the screen, but it's just going to respond to where it's already set. It's not going to scroll through or be specific to where you touch it, so just touching it will click on whatever is already highlighted. Tapping on the screen outside of the menu will close that menu though, so just be aware of that if you are using the touch screen in this way. To get through the menu, you'll scroll using the scroll wheel and then click on the wheel to select what you have highlighted. So let's just quickly run through the menu and give you an idea of what is built in there. Opening it up, the first option is guides. You can turn them on to a couple different percentages or different aspect ratios. And you can also go over to custom where you can dial in the uh, horizontal and vertical percentages yourself. You can turn the guide masks on or off. You can turn a crosshair on or off. And for the grids, you can actually dial in up to 10 grid lines on screen here, which is pretty insane. I've never seen a need for that many, but you can dial that in right here. The last option is to go back to the main menu, so we'll do that. 
and then jump down to video configuration. As you can see here, if you have a lot applied, a lot of these things are going to be grayed out, but you do have options to go in and dial in your brightness, contrast, chroma, sharpness, tint, and color temperature uh, if you have the LUT turned off. And you can also adjust the backlight. I have it set on 100 right now just to give me the brightest possible output. And you can adjust your aspect ratio, of course, between a few different choices here. Next up is system configuration. And there's a couple of options for the on-screen display, which is this right here. You can choose between English and Chinese at the moment. And then the on-screen duration is just how long it will stay on. I'm going to turn that off because I don't want this to automatically turn off as I'm going through the menu and explaining it here. You can also adjust the transparency from low to middle to high and off. As you can see right here, the effect takes place as you adjust it. And then you also have a couple of different user menus. You have five actually, and that's really great if you want to have some different custom functions uh, programmed into these function buttons here and switch between them very quickly. Or if you do have multiple people using the, uh, the monitor, you can adjust things for how they specifically want to use it and just switch back and forth very quickly. System reset is pretty self-explanatory and you do have a confirmation window that pops up here to make sure you want to reset it before you accidentally do that. Flip control will jump into another menu here where you can control the display and the on-screen display, which is this menu here separately, and you can control them both horizontally and vertically uh, independently, which is really cool. This is a good amount of uh, customization for how to flip the screen here, which can really cover you in a lot of different situations. Next up, you can turn the battery voltage display, which is up here in the corner, on or off. And you can also turn the touch control on or off, which is nice if you don't want to accidentally touch stuff as you're handling the monitor. Next up, let's take a look at the LUT configuration. You have a couple options here. You got stored from USB, which is the LUT that you've already loaded from the USB onto the monitor, and you can just turn them on and off very quickly by clicking the wheel. Let's go back to the next option, which is the USB looks. Now this will be where you're gonna load your looks from your USB, your LUTs from your USB. So I'll plug a USB into there and show you exactly what that's gonna look like. First up, you'll get this screen here. Just choose your 3D LUT, which is the USB. Choose your directory, which is C in this case, and you have a couple of folders on here. This 3D LUT pack is already included on the USB when you get the monitor, and there are a couple options in here for uh, Canon, Panasonic, and Sony. When you want to load one onto the monitor, just highlight it and click, and you'll see that loading like a loading bar. And when it's finished, you'll see the little mark next to it that shows that this has been saved to your monitor. Let's go back to exit out of this screen. Just click the exit button right next to the scroll wheel and it will bring you back and it will bring you back again and again one more time to go back to the standard monitor layout here. Going back into the LUT configuration, you can see now if you go into the stored from USB folder, that LUT that I just loaded onto here is here in this folder and it's selected. I'm actually gonna deselect that and go back to my LUT that I've loaded myself. And if you want to delete one of these from this list, just highlight it and hold the wheel down a couple of seconds and you'll get this menu confirmation menu here. If you want to delete it, click yes, and then it's gone. So that's how you load and delete LUTs from the monitor. Next up is function setup, and this is going to be a big one for this monitor. So this is where you set the functions of each of these four custom function buttons on the top here. Right now I have these set uh, to audio meters, peaking, luma waveform, and false color. But let's just take a look at all of the things that can be mapped to these function buttons. Clicking it, you can scroll through audio meters, 5D Mark II recording, pixel to pixel, brightness, contrast, chroma, sharpness, tint, color temperature, aspect ratio, backlight, camera control, display flip, on-screen display flip, check field, HV delay, guides, crosshair, grids, peaking, false color, zebra, underscan, DSLR scaling, histogram, luma waveform, zooming, and back to audio meters. Now each of these function buttons can be set to any of these that I just scrolled through, so you can set this up exactly how you want. And like I said, you have five user menus here, so if you want to have a couple of different uh, configurations, you can switch between those very easily without having to dive into this and select each one individually each time. But like I said, if you look here, it looks like there's really not a lot of control over these functions. However, there is on this monitor, which is really, really nice. You can control quite a bit about most of these different functions. So let's go ahead and take a look at all of that customization for these four that I have programmed into here right now. One thing I wanna note here is that if you kind of forget which functions you have mapped to which button, if you just tap on screen, you can see them all pop up at the top and you can turn them on and off with the touch screen here, but it's also just a really nice reminder of what you have mapped to each of those functions. So especially if you're switching back and forth 
forth between different user profiles or if you're changing these functions, you know, depending on where you're shooting or who's shooting. It's really nice to be able to just tap and see what's here without having to toggle them on and off to see what did I have set to function three? What did I have set to function four? In any case, pushing the button will toggle this on and off. I have the audio meter set to function one. And as you push the button, you can see a little reminder here that if you long press for three seconds, you can set the function. And what that means is when you hold it for three seconds, this extra little audio meters specific menu will pop up on screen where you can really go in and customize these settings more in detail. For audio meters, you can obviously turn them on or off. You can choose their position, in this case from the left to divide it between the left and right, right only, bottom or top. And then you can go in and dial in their blending, which is just how much it will blend with the image behind it. So the higher you go, the more transparent it is. When the lower you go, the more the less transparent it is so the more clearly you can see it but you can dial that all in in this little sub menu here function two i have set to peaking so let's take a look at that sub menu if you hold it down for a few seconds you can choose the factor which is how sensitive it is all the way from one to ten and you can also dial in the color between red green blue black and white so depending on you know maybe the color of your image what you have going on in your image you can dial in that color to make it easier to see my third custom function is one that was just added, and this is a Luma waveform, which you can see pop up on the bottom here. It's small, but it looks like a nice waveform, which is a very, very nice thing to have in a monitor this cheap. And I've almost never seen it, if not never seen it in a monitor this cheap. So I'm really happy that they added that in here. But at the moment, there's not a lot of customization um, for the position or anything, actually. So holding that button down will not do anything. I suspect that that's something maybe they'll add a little bit of more customization to in the future, so I'm looking forward to that. Finally, my fourth function is set to false colors, and if we hold that down for a few seconds to open up its sub menu, you can see that you can customize the underwarning and overwarning, and those are the extremes here on the end of the scale. For the underwarning, you can dial it in from negative 10 to positive 15, and for the overwarning, you can go from 85 to 110. So you can really customize that for kind of the maximum or minimum uh, you want your camera to reach in terms of under or over exposure and you'll be able to see that very clearly with a bright red or bright pink of course you can also turn the tool tip on or off so if you don't need to see it on the bottom here you can turn that off to get it out of the way but if you want it as a visual reminder you can keep it on so I've gone ahead and set a few different custom functions here just to show you a few more examples. If you tap on screen, I've got the guides, zebras, and zooming that are new that I want to show you. So if I turn on my guides, things like the guides, it's not a simple on and off kind of function. It, it's got a bunch of different options. So as you click the button or touch on screen, it's going to cycle through all of those different options, as you can see here. If I hold down the button to jump into that custom menu for the guides, of course you can set the different aspect ratios here, but you can also select the color from red to green to blue to black to white. And then more than that, you can also select the thickness of these lines. So as I scroll here, you can see that as I scroll up, they get thicker. And this actually goes all the way up to 50, which is really thick. And I don't really personally see any use for it, but you know, you can do that if you want to. But you can also turn them off, which is cool because you don't have to have those lines there if you don't want them to. You can just have the black bars, but um, you can really customize that exactly how you want it. And then you can also turn these masks, the black bars on or off. So if you want to see what's outside Side of your framing maybe sometimes that can be useful or if you don't if you want to get just more of a clear image of what your final uh, aspect ratio will look like you can turn those on but again there's a lot more customization in this sub menu here next up is our zebras and as i turn this on i just want to mention that this is not your traditional zebras with the lines going through your overexposed areas this is going to be more of an over and under exposure warning and you can see this little guide that pops up at the bottom and if i jump into the custom menu you can get a better idea of what that means you can set your over and under exposure warnings here just as before for under exposure from minus 10 to positive 15 and for over exposure from 85 up to 110 and then you can turn this tooltip on and off and what it's going to do is just highlight those areas which are overexposed or underexposed in this color so if i change my overexposure to a little bit of a lower value here like 85 and then i exit out of here let me go and change my camera settings you can see that as that white area becomes overexposed over 85 IRE, it's going to be highlighted to show me, hey, hey, this is overexposed according to the settings that you set. So zooming is an option I wanted to show just because there are a couple of different ways you can do it here. With the touch screen turned on, you can pinch to zoom like this and then scroll around your image very easily, which is really, really 
intuitive for anybody who's ever used a smartphone, but maybe you have the touch screen turned off and you can't do that. So zooming is going to be one of those custom functions you can set. And if you turn on the little sub menu here, you can see that you can actually select really a lot of details about how it's going to zoom for you. So you can offset it so it's not necessarily in the center. You can also choose the ratio of how much it's going to zoom. I personally prefer, you know, the pinch and zoom and drag style because, you know, just again, like I said, for anybody who's ever used a smartphone, it's going to be very, very intuitive to do it this way. And it's very, very quick and easy. There is one more very important custom function that I haven't talked about, and I'm actually not going to talk about it in this video, and that is the camera control, because if you do have an extra part for this, you can connect it to your camera, depending on which camera model you have, and you can actually take control of your camera. You can change settings like aperture, uh, shutter speed, and you can even uh, change your focus. So you can control the focus right from the screen, which is going to be really useful in a lot of different situations. It's a little bit more complex, I'm going to go into that in a separate video. So I apologize for this menu walkthrough portion of the video becoming so long, but like I said, it seems complex at first, but I actually feel like it's a much simpler way to pack a lot of customization into a relatively simple menu, since you only have to deal with all that really deep customization when you really need it, and it's only for those specific functions that you are actually using. So there is a lot to it, but it doesn't clutter up the main menu. So overall, this monitor has been awesome, but just to be fair, let's run through some of the quick negatives and then wrap this up. So it's not super bright, like I said, it's 450 nits, but Portkeys does also have a number of different brighter monitors with different feature sets, and they all look great. So if this monitor in particular isn't the one for you, I definitely recommend you check out what else they have to offer, because for what it is, this monitor has really done a fantastic job of doing what it's meant to do, and it gave me a fair amount of confidence in their overall lineup. I'd like to have a mounting option or two included in the box, you know, just a simple ball head or an articulating arm, just something for people that don't already have something to mount this with. I do have a few other small complaints that are more specific to the camera control feature, so we'll get more into those in that video, but I just want to say that overall the camera control feature does work pretty well. It seems to work pretty much on the same level as Canon's Canon Control app uh, on the iPad, and to say that it works almost at the same level as Canon's own software is really saying something for the performance of this uh, feature on this monitor. So yeah, just to wrap it up, overall, this monitor is really a winner in my book. If you don't need camera control or if you want a little bit more brightness, the performance here and everything really gives me 100% confidence that their other monitors will fulfill your needs because this really does exactly what it's meant to do with no fuss and no bugs. I love that you can load lots into here. The menu system is perfect for me. Small things like being able to tap on screen to get a visual reminder of what your four custom function settings are is really helpful and just it's been a very nice monitor to use. So as always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below and I will definitely get back to you. If you like this video or found it helpful, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to see more in the future, and as always, thank you for watching.